Welcome back to another episode of Costume Cinematographico, and this being my first top 10 most compelling costumes for Game of Thrones. This one for the debut episode of season seven. And I'll be doing these episode recaps all through the summer. So if you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And for those of you returning to the channel, you might find that I repeat some things that I have covered in previous videos. But for those of you who are new, I will leave a link in the description below covering all of the season seven costume breakdown so far. And a warning, there will be spoilers in this episode for everything that's happened so far in the show and more importantly, from the new season of Game of Thrones season seven. So if you haven't seen it yet, episode one, come back and watch when you have finished. And I also have a few leaked photos that I'm going to share. Uh, I don't think that they will spoil any plot points for you, but I just want to share them with you because they'll sort of help tell the story. So let's count down what I think are the most compelling costumes in episode one, starting with number 10. Littlefinger has dressed very consistently since season one, except that his clothing has sort of gotten warmer the more north he goes. And it's not really surprising that his palette matches that of Sansa. Littlefinger seen here wearing a boucle wool hoopalant, which is an outer garment that was popular during the Middle Ages. And the distinct characteristic of this type of garment, it has long hanging sleeves and a full length, full body. You might remember that Littlefinger dressed Sansa and himself in matching hoopalons back in season five, and I kind of thought that was cute. Here you can see that when his coat falls away, it shows his other coat underneath. The hoopalon is sometimes lined in fur, although it appears that his coat is merely trimmed with fur. And in this close-up on the right is a pin of Littlefinger's personal sigil, the Mockingbird. Here's a better shot at the textured fabric with just a glimpse at the gray lining. They've added darts at the side front uh, just to create some shaping throughout the body. And I've been promising a little finger dedicated video, so I hope that I can get to that uh, for you before the summer is done. Queen Cersei has completely made over the King's Guard from the traditional gold and white lacquered uniform worn by only seven knights and without the gold cloaks, I might add, to this black lacquered, more sinister style plate armor with silver trimmings. And one thing that I failed to mention before in my previous videos is that the gambeson or the coats that they wear underneath the armor, they're actually made from the same cut black leather from Cersei's coronation gown. And the embossed silver embellishment that's on the breastplate and the shoulders, it's taken from the abstracted Lannister lion that you'll see in Cersei's crown. And But I think the standout feature of the armor are these sort of lobster tail style pauldrons, which are the shoulder guards. In this other shot of the mountain, now I suppose he's the commander of the King's Guard, we see his coat is cut to the knee, but the front of his legs are covered with plate metal greaves or shin guards. And you might have noticed that Jaime, he's no longer a member of the King's Guard, instead he's dressing in Lannister armor. I love this shot of the King's Guard following after Cersei, looking very much like some black stormtroopers. Not too much of a surprise for Miss Sunday and Grey Worm, looking very much like they belong to the Targaryen party. Miss Sunday's tunic has the hexagonal cut in the front skirt now that costume designer Michelle Clapton has abandoned the arched openings. She's also wearing the same cobra style leather harness that Danny wore in season three, although it's been dyed black. Here's a back view so you'll see what I mean. Grey Worm's costume is a slightly modified unsullied uniform, except with the, the addition of a studded brigandine jacket under his armor and a slightly altered gorget, this one with a three-headed dragon pin. Here is Grey Worm's brooch on the left and Missandei's identical brooch on the right, although she actually wasn't wearing it in the season opener. And it appears that to have been an off-camera gift to the two characters at some point from Danny, since they're the only ones who are wearing them. Miss Sandy's brooch also holds up a shoulder cape of sorts. And I suspect that Steenson's jewelers in Ireland custom made these pieces.
Tyrion is somewhat subdued here. You might recall that he said nothing for the actually the entire episode, allowing Danny to have her moment upon her return to Dragonstone. So his clothes, like Miss Sandy and Grey Worm, are in like, you know, tones of charcoal gray and black. And the most notable item, of course, is the silver hand of the uh, hand of the queen brooch that Danny presents Tyrion with in season six. As I've mentioned before, Tyrion has had one of the greatest character arcs in the entire series, and his clothing has reflected this. So gone are his Lannister fineries, like the beautiful brocades and silks that he once wore, the gold embellishments. So here he's just wearing a very simple leather jerkin, cloth trousers, and a simple striped brocade doublet underneath. So they're still good quality, but without all the bells and whistles. I was amazed at how much this actress who played Leanna Mormont has grown in the past year. So her clothing is very similar to the Starks and her fellow Northerners. So she wears a long flowing cloak with cross straps and a pelt collar. Given her speech about not sitting by the fire, it seems only fitting that as the Lady of House Mormont, under her cloak, she's dressed in men's clothing. Here's an onset shot of her without the cape. She's dressed in a cloth gambeson with the bound skirt tabs and a matching jerkin, trousers, and leather boots. We know that Arya will eventually have a new set of duds because of the promotional shots we see that we've seen in Entertainment Weekly. But for now, we have to make do with this ensemble, which is a collection of rough traveling clothes that she's obtained somehow. And I'd mentioned before that her cloak looks sort of stark in style, and perhaps she's intended it to look that way. But the difference, of course, is that instead of a fur pelt collar, she has this rough suede one. And Arya also no longer hiding that she's a girl. I mean, she's now nearly a woman, and she's actually let her hair grow out a bit. Like Danny, Sansa's costume is an entire amalgamation of all of her looks from the previous six seasons. And while I know some of you are missing her beautiful flowing gowns, I doubt she'll be going back in that direction anytime soon. And as, as she said in this episode, she's learned a great deal from Cersei. So in a symbolic way, she's using her own form of armor by way of a leather belt and jewelry to protect herself. The color in this episode, at least where the costumes are concerned, has been kind of really drained out. And Clapton had mentioned last season that it shows that things are getting more serious. Sansa has incorporated a few elements from her dark Sansa look, including her needle pendant, this one now silver and missing the crossbar, and her collar has the stark sigil closures, uh, which is a form of jewelry for northerners in Winterfell. In this close-up image on the left, you can see the fur trim cuffs on her gown, and on the right, the raven feather trim on her bodice. Sansa wears a charcoal gray cloak with a batiked leaf motif, perhaps, as one viewer mentioned, a werewood leaf. And most importantly, Sansa wears a wolf pelt collar. Back in season one, you might remember she wore a rabbit collar, like all highborn children do at Winterfell, but now she's no longer a child, she is a grown woman. And what of the Mad Queen herself, dressed in somber black and silver tones in keeping with her deadness inside? I'm not going to touch on this costume because, as you might have recognized, it's uh, Cersei's coronation gown from season six. This costume, however, is new. We get a few shots of her wearing it in both the throne room and in the exterior shot. This costume actually goes way back to the original teaser and the HBO promo, so we've actually seen quite a bit of this costume. And I've done a complete breakdown on it, uh, all of her season's looks actually, so if you want to check them out, I'll leave a link in the description below. This, however, is the best image to date that I've seen of her gorget and pauldrons, or the collar and shoulder pad thingies that she wears on her gown. And one thing that pleased me is how great this all looked on camera. So in this shot, you can clearly see the Lannister sigil, uh, and it's not abstracted at all like it is on her crown. And she's getting kind of matchy, maybe a little bit too matchy, you know, with the Queen's Guard and even in the redecorating the throne room. 
and I'll admit all the silver and black, it's beginning to be a bit much considering that Danny also uses silver and black as her theme colors. And as a side note, I just found out the other day that the wired metallic braid used by embroidery artist Michelle Carriger on Circe's collar was actually provided by Krynik Manufacturing Company Inc. and they're out of West Virginia. And the color that they used was natural pewter. So again, I'll leave a link in the description below if you're interested in that. Daenerys Targaryen clothes the premiere in this stunning Targaryen inspired costume. And I've done a very detailed explanation of her costume in another video, which I'll leave a link for. The one thing I have to say about it is that the still pictures really didn't do it justice. You could really see the gorgeous embroidery work of Michelle Carricker. It just really justified all the painstaking hours, most likely weeks of work, you know, maybe even months, put into that costume for just one great moment. And what I love most about it, especially, you know, that, I, you know, I was able to watch it in high definition, you could see the sharpness of the crystals on the collar. I mean, they look so sharp that they might actually cut you. And the Ruby Swarovski crystal beads, they actually caught the light and sparkled in the sun. And if you didn't know, actually, Swarovski crystals, they're just high-end Austrian beads that have a, you know, they, they glisten really nicely. Game of Thrones really held Euron's reveal close to the vest. Yes, and that's a wardrobe pun. Euron shows up on Cersei's doorstep in full leather, including some tight trousers to show off his rather large appendage to offer himself as a potential suitor to Cersei. In case you forgot what he looked like from before, here he wears an Iron Island studded cloth brigandine from season six, the Armada of Greyjoy ships, and actually Euron himself kind of remind me of Captain Jack Sparrow in his swagger. You know, there's a little bit of Keith Richards and some Ozzy Osbourne thrown in for good measure. In case you're wondering why his hair is so short, I think it's because uh, the actor who plays Euron had this style seen here in Ghost in the Shell, which was just released uh, before season seven of Game of Thrones. So I don't think it was actually a design decision. Euron's a cocky and cockney rock and roller trying to get with the queen. The only thing that I've been able to piece together and keeping in mind that the reason that costume designer Michelle Clapton made these decisions is perhaps that Euron has had this outfit tailored for his parlay with Cersei, wanting something that advertises his assets. But, you know, since Euron is kind of crass, this is what he sort of came up with. Clapton has been on a bit of a leather kick lately, especially these cut leather pieces that have been popping up on Tywin, Cersei, and now Euron. And you know, honestly, I'll admit, it's getting a tad boring. The leathers themselves, they are beautiful. As I mentioned in the previous video, both Charles Dance and Lena Headey's costumes were constructed from the leather producers D'Alessio Galliano in Rome, Italy. So, you know, it's likely that Euron's star cut leather jacket comes from the same supplier. Okay, so here's a leaked photo. I don't think it shows much else, hopefully not, but I just wanted to show you this as an example. So Euron here, he wears what looks like a full length sleeveless leather coat, and it has you know, more connection to the Iron Islands at least. And I think that Euron should have worn this in his meeting with Cersei. It would have really anchored it down his look more instead of just looking so contemporary, like 20th century. And for the actor, while I think he was awesome, like he was really great, it would have given him more to work with. Euron's shirt, it's similar to the bib front Civil War era shirt made popular in Westerns by actor John Wayne. And this style of shirt has also been featured in the greatest of space Westerns, Star Wars, seen here on its hero, Luke Skywalker. So Euron was clearly attempting to up his sexiness factor by wearing his shirt open. So what do you think of this list? Did I miss any of your favorites? If so, feel free to leave it in the comments below. And I'll be back with another recap next week. In the meantime, you can check out my series on the costumes of Westeros. And as always, thank you so much for watching.